All right, good evening. Good to have you here this evening for our, our study. And we are in uh, Job chapter 3 tonight, so you can make your way uh, to Job chapter 3 um, while I uh, give some introductory remarks. But let's start with uh, prayer, and then we'll jump into it. God, we thank you for this evening and the kindness you have shown us in Jesus and the beauty of knowing you through your word. And we pray as we spend uh, a few minutes in your word tonight that it would be fruitful, that you would draw our hearts closer to you and fill us with your joy. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I uh, just want to remind you of the schedule. There's one up here if you already had one. And so if you want to know what's coming up each week, you can use the schedule. Um, there's no homework. Uh, but if you wanted to uh, read the chapter or two before you came in, maybe it would help. I don't know if it would or wouldn't. Uh, or maybe you'd like to be surprised. Um, so uh, the schedule is there. Uh, in the schedule, uh, I don't think we'll be changing the schedule. And you'll notice the plan is to go through the book of Job. It's one to two chapters, uh, very occasionally maybe three chapters. But I think it's just one to two chapters I'm looking here. Yeah, I don't see any places we do three chapters in one evening. Um, we'll be planning on, we'll finish Job in on May 3rd. So, <clears throat> right, so that's 30-some sessions. And uh, we talked about it last week. You uh, likely will miss some of those, uh, might, would be my guess, if not all of them. I don't know. Uh, but this year, we wanted to provide some tools because we're going through the book over the course of a long period of time, uh, and, and we know how it gets when it gets dark and the weather changes. So uh, we have set up on our website a place where, where two things are available to you. Number one, uh, if you want to see the study on Wednesday night and you just can't get out of the house or, I suppose, don't want to get out of the house, you know, we are live streaming it on our website. And so you're able to, uh, right now it's on, so I don't know if there's anybody watching it, but uh, if you're at home and want to live stream it, you are able to do that in the event that you don't want to, leave, don't want to or can't leave the house, especially in the wintertime, it gets cold, and then of course it's still sunny out, but it's not going to be too long and it's going to be dark before we get uh, down here. And uh, so that's one thing. Also, once we've had the study, we post that video, uh, we're, we're going to put that on that same Web page. So right now there's one video. It's from last week. So if you weren't here last week and you would like to see the video, um, I was here for it. I don't know. If, yeah. No, I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, you may find that useful. So here's how to find that particular place. You go to the fbcmedford.org, fbcmedford.org. On the top, there's a little menu bar and there's a, a heading. It says Info Hub. Info Hub. And when you click on that, it has a drop-down menu, and it says FBC Wednesday night. Click on that, because what's tonight? Wednesday night. There you go. Click on that Wednesday night, and if it's Wednesday night, like right now, you click on it, the window with the live stream would already be there, and you just hit play, and it would start. Below that window with the live stream, you'll have a link for each of the videos. Right now, there's just one link for last week's video. Sometime tomorrow afternoon, there will be two of them, because tonight's video will be posted on there. So if you miss one, you can uh, keep up with what's going on if you want uh, to do that. Uh, all right, does that make sense? If you have questions or you're not able to find that site or you're not familiar with how to use it, uh, you can always uh, give us a call at the church office or send me an email. Um, all right, we're in Job chapter 3. Let's just remind ourselves again of chapters 1 and 2. Um, because it's really important we understand what's going on in Job. So just a couple of highlight. We're, we're not going to do the entire study from last week. You have the video. You can go watch it. But, but one of the primary things we need to keep in mind, the theme of Job is not suffering. The theme of Job is not suffering. The, the theme of Job is on our screen there to some degree. It's uh, life when God doesn't make sense. The theme of Job is God doesn't make any sense. I look at my life, I look at God, and God doesn't make any sense based on what's happening in my life. And Job is the study of how do you wrestle through that reality. And, and if you have not been in that reality or aren't 
currently in that reality, just wait a minute. It's coming. This is a, the, a universal experience of the believer. Is that you, You've read your Bible. I know what God is like. I know I, I trust him. And then things happen in your life, and you think, I don't know that these two things are compatible. These don't, this doesn't really make sense. That's exactly what Job is dealing with. So in that case, we have to remember then, suffering isn't the theme, it's the setting. Suffering is just the place where Job is wrestling with that reality. So the theme is not how do you get through suffering or how do you make suffering end. We talked at length last week of all the questions Job doesn't answer. Remember that? And most of you were very disappointed. Some people were so disappointed they're not here tonight. They said, forget it. I thought Job was going to answer all these questions. Job doesn't answer the question of why do we suffer? How do we make suffering end? How do we get God to stop being mean? Doesn't answer any of those questions. Job shows us what it looks like to struggle through that reality. God doesn't seem to make sense in terms of what's going on in my life. The structure of Job, there's three parts to it. There's the first part, which was chapter 1 and 2. We covered it. It's the, the background information of why Job, uh, what, why the events in Job's life occurred. They occurred at the hand of God. God brought about these things. The third part of the book is at the very end, God tells us a little bit of his perspective. And then the, the, the last chapter, chapter 42, it's wrapped up in how we see Job respond to God's feedback. In, the, in those several chapters where God is talking with Job are, are some of my favorite sections of Scripture. And uh, it's one of the few times in the Bible where I sort of wonder if God doesn't have just a bit of a grin on his face. And uh, when we get to it, uh, but when God is saying to Job, gird your loins like a man, you will answer me, you could tell he's just maybe just a bit of a smirk. Um, that could just be me, though, you know. The rest of it, so the, the two sections, chapters 1 and 2, what's going on? The last section where God speaks and it's wrapped up. The main body of the book is what we begin tonight in chapter 3. It's the conversation between Job and his three friends, okay? So his three friends are going to come and visit and sit with him. Job is going to talk, and then one of his friends is going to talk. Then Job is going to talk some more, and then one of his friends is going to talk some more. So we're going to do this back and forth now for the next, really, several months. And we're going to be looking at how Job is wrestling with this reality. God doesn't make sense. And we're going to be looking at how his friends are trying to make it make sense. So his friends are coming in, and they're going to make an argument to try and show him, oh, no, we can show you, Job, how this makes sense. And let me give it away because I gave it away a little bit last week. This is basically their argument. Your predicament makes perfect sense because everybody who sins badly has bad stuff happen to them. So therefore, since bad stuff is happening to you, we know what? You have done something bad. Now, Job is going to admit that he is a sinner. He, he does it several times in the book. But they in particular are saying, you've done something you know, really bad. In order for God to treat you this way, you must have done something really bad. So what's the fix? And they're going to argue this repeatedly. So the fix, Job, is to confess what you've done really bad, repent to the Lord, and maybe he will show you his mercy. And Job's response generally is, you guys are idiots. You know, something to this effect. No, no that's not what I've done. That, and so that's why Job is struggling. He's going, what? I'm not saying I'm not a sinner, but I don't think I did something where my children should have all been killed in a tornado. I don't, I don't think that's, it doesn't make sense about what I know of God. So that's the struggle. And his friends are, they're really trying to help him, but they're coming at it from a religious a background that isn't helpful. So that's the section we're in. So tonight we're in chapter 3, and it's Job's first uh, occasion where he is going to start wrestling with the realities of his suffering. Just to remind us, look at the end of chapter 2, verse 11. Job's free, three friends heard about all the evil that had come upon him, 
They came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, Zophar the Namathite. And they made an appointment together to come show him sympathy and comfort. When they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. They raised their voices and wept, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. They sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. So his friends come, and they sit with him for seven days in a period of mourning, uh, sitting Shiva is what we call that, uh, just experiencing his sadness with him. One of the things this tells us is his friends actually had good intentions. They weren't coming to Job to be jerks. Later on, Job is going to tell them, not only have you not helped me, you've made it worse. So he is going to tell them that. But that's not what their intention was. Their intention was to come to provide practical aid to their suffering friend, and it shows here. So Job is now going uh, to speak. Uh, I don't know whether you like it or not, we're, throughout the course of this evening or you know, this time we have together, we're going to read this entire chapter, but I'm going to do it uh, in section. Are you okay with that? Good. So verses 1 and 2 is the introduction. After this, after what? After seven days of sitting with nobody saying anything other than the occasional sound of pottery being scraped on an oozing sore. You're welcome for that. Oh, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth, and Job said. Okay, what did Job curse? Day of his birth. What did Job not curse? God didn't curse God. Really, really important. That's the distinction here. He's cursing the day of his birth. What else did he not curse, or who else did he not curse? Didn't curse his friends, didn't curse his wife. That one was a close one, though. We know that was close. <laughs> he also didn't curse himself. So he didn't say of himself, I should experience condemnation. He didn't say God should be condemned. He doesn't really at this point condemn his friends, although later on he's going to speak with them very sharply. And he doesn't condemn himself. He merely condemns the day of his birth. So this is going to be really important as we work our way through his, uh, his speech here in understanding this, because here's what he is going to develop, and I'm going to hopefully show you this as we work our way through this poem. Job sees God as the cause of all things in life. So from birth to death to the tides to the moon going up, moon going down, everything that happens, Job sees God as the cause, not an uh, absentee cause, not a passive in not, uh, uh, Job would not like this phrase, God allowed it to happen. Have you ever used that phrase? Job would say, no, 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 he did it. Job would say that. He, he didn't, didn't just sort of like get out of the way. Job doesn't believe in that theology. Job would say, no, no, God, his hand grabbed the thing and did it. And, and because of that, when he looks at the realities of life, since he believes God causes everything, I'm going to now look at the realities of my life. Dead kids, camels stolen, dead servants, fire from heaven. How do I struggle with the reality of God himself? Given that, if I look at my life, I have to say God is in this. And he, so the, the real issue, as one writer said for Job, is, is not the physical suffering. Oh, and, although that was bad. That was bad. Because we'll notice throughout the book, it is only on the rarest of of occasions, he actually talks about the suffering itself. There's, I think there's only one chapter where he talks about the condition of his skin. He never mentions his financial losses. He never mentions the loss of his children. He does mention at a certain point that his skin is feverish and darkened, probably from infection. All of his complaints are about God, and here's why. He wonders if he's lost his friend. He and God are close. He and God have a close relationship from his perspective, and his suffering is not so much what was going on. He just looks at his suffering and says, is God, did I, are God and I no longer friends? And this is where his loss uh, really, really um, becomes profound. So what Job chapter 3 is him sort of thinking out loud, sort of processing verbally out loud, as you might do if maybe you've done this, especially if no one's home and it's just you and your house, and something bad happens, if you ever paced around the living room sort of muttering, and, uh, and then somebody bangs on the wall next door, who are you talking to? 
uh, I'm on the phone, you know, <laughs> try to make up something. So this is Job sort of just working through it out loud. And let's look at, uh, at some of the ways he, he thinks about this. So some questions and complaints to God. Verses 3 through 10, the first section we'll read, Job uh, curses the day of his birth. So this, there's three or four sections in this poem. This first section, verses 3 through 10, are him cursing the day of his birth. Let me read it. Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said a man is conceived. Verse 4, let the day be darkness, may God above not see it, nor let light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it, let clouds dwell upon it, let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it, let it not rejoice among the days of the year, let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren, let no joyful cry enter it. Let not those, or I should say, let those who curse it, who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of its dawn be dark, let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. Okay, so let's kind of work through that and maybe a little bit explain uh, some stuff about how Hebrew poetry works. And I know that gets you energized, doesn't it? Yeah, let's talk about ancient Hebrew poetry. Yeah, okay. Is there any way we can talk about cars or guns? No, it's Hebrew poetry. Here we go. Uh, Job curses his birth. And, and we want to understand this. One of the primary things he's trying to communicate here is who is in charge of who is born? God makes all the kids. This is a common biblical theme. God makes all the kids. Everybody is from the hand of God, made in the image of God. If someone is birth, it's because God ensured that they became. And so what Job here is doing is he is saying, uh, God had me born, and I've got some issues with this. And, and I don't understand why. When I'm looking at my life now, God on purpose had me born, and, and I kind of wish that he would have made a different decision. Okay, and, and what he is saying is he, want, he establishes this, this cursing. If you look at it, if you'll notice as I read it, he talks about day and night, darkness and, and light. He's contrasting these themes, and he wants his day of his birth to be a one of night and darkness. Yeah, Dan. He's, uh, what we would say, the discussion is a little bit strange. He's talking out loud, and, and you know what's funny, Dan, that's a really good question, is whenever we look at any of the speeches, so one of the guys is going to talk next. He doesn't really respond to Job's speech per se. He just says what he's going to say. And then when Job chimes in, he doesn't necessarily, we're used to in, in sort of Western, um, the way we think is very Roman and Greek, is if you were to say something, I'd be in my mind working out how I counter your points. And I'd say, okay, you said this, know this. You said this, know this. They don't do that. They basically make long speeches, which may or may not refer to one another's speeches, uh, but they have very, but they, so they're talking around each other, not always talking to each other. Does that kind of make sense? So he's not, and, and his friends haven't said anything yet. This is seven days of silence, and Job finally says, curse my birthday. Yeah, that's kind of where, where we start, and his friends are going to come in and maybe offer a different perspective, but not challenge individual points. Next week, we'll see some of that. We'll try to, I'll try to remember to show us some of that. So um, look at verse 3. A little bit about Hebrew poetry, and then we'll move on from the Hebrew poetry stuff, but this is important. Hebrew poetry doesn't always rhyme. We like rhyming poems in English. Uh, Hebrew poetry very rarely rhymes. Instead of rhyming, they, have, they rhyme with ideas. So the first line, let the day perish on which I was born, and on the night that was said, a man is conceived. So the first line, he talks about birth. And in the third line, he talks about conception. So these two related ideas are a way of saying the same thing in a different way. And, and Hebrew does that all the time. Usually in most Hebrew poetry, in, in fact, many of the Psalms, you can remove the second line of all the stanzas and still get the poem because it's just repeating the same idea in a little different way. 
So he's saying, think about the day I was born. And not merely the day, and he is not saying when he say the day I was conceived, and some of you are doing the math. Well, those two days are nine months apart, right? He's, not, he's talking about the same thing. The occasion of his coming into being, his birth, which would include his conception because his birth necessitated that. And he's saying, let that day, the, the time period of my coming into being, that day should be cursed. Uh, in verse 4, a day of total darkness and loneliness. Verse 4 says, may God above not seek it. What he's saying here is, may, may God abandon the day of my birth. Maybe, I, I wish God would have not been present for me to become. You know, may God not see it. And, and, and I wish God would have uh, abandoned uh, that day. Verse 5, gloom and deep darkness. That's, so he's, he's wishing upon that day a, a, a day of total gloom. And in fact, he even says on the, the, the third line of verse 5, let, let the blackness of the day terrify it. You know, so there's different kinds of darkness. You know, there's, there's the kind of darkness at night when you turn the lights off in your bedroom and, you, and you're at peace. It's quiet and it's calm and your eyes can finally close and you can go to sleep for, a, for an hour or two or however long you're, you're able to sleep, right? And you, and you go to sleep. Then there's another kind of darkness and it's when there's suddenly a bump. You're, you're sitting in your room and it's, it's dark and, and, and suddenly there's noise. And, and in our house, there's noise, and the dog in her crate starts scurrying around. And then you go, okay, the dog is scared. I think I should be. And then you get up, and you sneak down the stairs, and it's just your middle son round working his way through the refrigerator. And he's like, man, now I wish it would have been a, a thief, because now we don't have food, because he just said, okay, anyway. So, it's when all, so this is what he's saying, is I wish the night of my birth was a night of dark terror. I, that's what I wish upon that night, not a, a night of, of, of joy. And this is in contrast to how most of us approach birthing. If you've had children or if you've had grandchildren, you know the occasion, especially of sitting by the phone, waiting for that joyful call. Phone rings, it's a boy, come down and say, say hello to, to whoever. And usually it's a time of great celebration, great happiness, and uh, and, and this instead, he's wishing that day was a day of terror and darkness because he's he wants the reality of his experience in life. He's saying, God, I wish you would have approached the day of my birth the same way you're approaching my life today. You know, I wish you know if you're going to do this, this is what you should have done back then. In many ways, he's he's in, and that's what he's going uh, going to say, especially in the second uh, section. So save that, Pam. And remind me, his wish for death uh, is verses 11 through 19. This is more of a, I was born, and I wish that day would be remembered of a day of, of great darkness. Verse 6, he says, let the darkness seize it. A, a day with no joy. He doesn't want a birthday party. He wants a, if, if you said, Job, let's have a birthday party, he'd say, it should be a funeral. It should be, it should be sad, and there should be wailing, and there should be uh, mourning. Uh, he even says it in verse 6. He says, uh, let it not come into the number of the months. Let it not be rejoiced among the days of the year. I wish everybody on their Outlook calendars would delete my birthday. And it wouldn't even show up on anybody's reminder. That it wouldn't, it wouldn't even show up. I wish that day was, was a day that didn't mention anything at all uh, about my birth. Look at verse 7. This has got some interesting uh, words in it. Behold, let that night be barren. Does anybody else's version have a different word for barren? So, so he's, he's now here at the end of it. He's starting to get a little bit graphic. He, he's saying, let that day be a day of, of stone. And he's describing his, the womb he was in. I wish the womb I was in was a womb of stone. That's what, that's, and, and then the English, the only way to translate it that, in a way that makes sense is barrenness. I wish that day when I was born, when it was time for the, uh, the pushing to start and, and all of the things you normally do to get a baby from the inside to the outside, I've never done it. It's just something totally foreign to me. Um, I wish at that point the womb would have been a womb of stone, that there would have been nothing. There would have been a womb of barrenness. I mean, that's really, he's starting to get really, uh, he, he's wishing that the person who delivered him would not have been able to. 
is what he's saying. So what's really, really important about Job's cursing of his birthday here is his, his understanding of who creates persons is God. So while he is saying that day is a day of darkness and he wished it would have ended with him being ended, this is going to sound strange, so I'm going to tie it into our cultural context. Because of this, Job is profoundly pro-life. So what he's doing, he, all he's saying is, I wish God would have ended my life then. Why is he saying that? Because nobody else should. God is the only one in charge of that. And so I wish the one person who has the right to give life and end it, that this is God, that he would have, that he would have done that. So he understands who's in control, and his argument here is, God didn't end my life then, as he had every right to do. And what, why is he struggling with that? God knew full well what was coming. If you knew what was coming, why would you let this baby be born? Why would you let that happen? And now, we need to be really, really careful here because we can tend to be a little bit divorced from the reality of Job's suffering because this is a long time ago. And we know how the story ends, right? Not all stories end happy. I just read a story this week about a little girl who died, and essentially she wasn't fed. This is in the States. This is in our country. It was a, a case of significant abuse to the degree that she was found. And she starved to death, and the authorities found her in the home. It's if, if you're not disturbed by that, I, I find it terribly disturbing. And so when you read, when you hear a story like that and you read this, don't you kind of go, well, yeah, actually it would have been for that little girl. Wouldn't it have been better if God would have just taken her home? So this is what Job, he, this is real stuff Job is really re struggling with. God, if, if you knew this was coming, why would you let me come out of that womb? It would have been better for that womb to be made of stone. So this is a real, and I think this is a really fair argument. What I really appreciate about Job's, arg Job's argument here is it's theologically sound. Who should end, who can end life? God. So, so he's going to eventually, not in this chapter, eventually he's going to have to wrestle with the reality. Did God end his life? No. And now I've got to interact with God in that reality. But at least here he's struggling with saying, I wish this would have happened on the day of my birth. Uh, verse 8, he says, anyone who's good, in, good at cursing. Anybody here good at cursing? Now, he's not necessarily talking about swearing, but of course, cursing involves swearing. If we curse something, we will damn it, right? We will say, wish that would be damned. And, and that's a, 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 a correct way of using a strong word for cursing. It, but, so he's not, he is saying here, cursing in the sense of, I wish that day was darkened. But he also is saying, we would assume, I mean, look at the language he's using. He is not one who is going to shy away from using the strongest of terms, not in a profane way like we might do, but in a way that is communicating in the strongest of ways, this day ought to be cursed. So anyone who's good at cursing, if you're good at cursing, then curse that day. Yeah, so uh, if you're going to use a day in vain, use the, the, the date of my birthday uh, in vain. And then he uses a very strange reference. Those who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Leviathan. We're going it, to, it's going to be a long time till we get to Leviathan and Job. It looks like April 26, Job 41. So you can read. Uh, uh, the Leviathan is, is talked about a number of different places in the scripture uh, m many times, and I think here as well as in Job 41, uh, it is uh, likely uh, a creature that at least is represented in nature. Uh, a lot of times the Leviathan stands in for the serpent, uh, Satan, the devil. And, um, and we know also that Leviathan often, in terms of thinking of creatures of the sea is sort of a, a way of thinking of uh, the sea in terms of its uncontrollability. Uh, the sea is still one of those places, even in our modern era, to, to venture off into the ocean is, is to really roll the dice. Um, and so he's saying, 
I wish my day was a day of like the Leviathan in the sea, totally uncontrollable, a day of chaos, a day of uncontrolled um, chaos. Yes, Gene. Why did he say the word curse twice in verse 8? He says, let those who curse it, who curse the day, who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. So I'm going to give you the short answer that's a cop-out. This verse, according to one writer, is in this section the most difficult verse to translate from the Hebrew. And, and so this is a fairly good way of saying, uh, you know, and, and if you looked at various versions, NIV, ESV, uh, NASB, you might see some different. So I think one of them even says, let the sorcerers, let the magicians curse it. So he's kind of saying, let those who are in the mystical arts curse it. I don't think that's what he's saying here because he doesn't mention magicians anywhere else. That's a very strange uh, way. So he's basically he's saying, people who like cursing stuff, curse that day and make it chaos like Leviathan, you know. Um, if I could say it in really terrible terms, the way you might say it is, uh, I would hope that at my birthday party, you would curse it with a giant alligator walking through. That's what I would like for my birthday to be. That he's so upset. I want, I want a giant alligator to walk through and bite people. So, well, why would you want that? Because I hate my birthday that much. I want people to post on Facebook pictures of the carnage because I'm so upset about my birth. You know, if that's a silly way of thinking about it. Um, verse 9, he gets even darker. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. So this is what's... Now, I love how Job really thinks about hopelessness here. There's one thing about being the darkness of night, the darkness of terror. Here in verse 9, he said, let the stars of its dawn be dark. Because somebody, uh, Churchill famously said, if you're going, to hell, going through hell, what's the end? Have you heard that one? If you're going through hell, keep going. Don't stop. Because that way you can get through it. That, that was Churchill's famous story. If you're going through hell, keep going. Because the, and, and there's another quote that people often say, that the night is darkest just before dawn. And the idea here is, okay, it's really, really bad, but if you just stick with it and bear down and get her done and plow through, pretty soon you'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. The, the sun will rise in the east. The hero will come. And here's what Job says. Let it hope for light, but have none. So he says, what I want, this is what I want you to think of my birthday. The darkest just before dawn, and then you realize dawn's never coming. That's, what, that's how he, so not only does he want you to have sort of this sense of, this is how he want you to think about this day of my life. Darkness, terror, quiet. But even if you have in the back of your mind a sense that maybe it'll get better in a minute, I want your hope to be shattered disappointed. One of my favorite movies is a movie called Shawshank Redemption. Anybody ever seen this film? Fantastic movie. It's rated R, so it's got some offensive stuff in it. And if you judge me on that, there's worse stuff. All right, so if you judge me on that, that's, I'll take it. All right. Um, but they're sitting in the cafeteria, and uh, uh, Dufresne has played music, and they ended up in in the hot box because he played music on the record. I don't know if you remember that scene. And then he finally comes into the cafeteria and sits down and read. Uh, you know, Morgan Freeman says, oh, why'd you do it? Why'd you play it? And then one guy said, why don't you at least play some good music? Why'd you play that classical music? Didn't they have any Johnny Cash? And, uh, and he said, it's to remind me of the outside, that there's beauty out there. And there's, there's stuff to be heard and seen that, are, that can fill your soul with joy. And, and red is lost. And he's like, I don't understand. He said, what's that about? And, and Andy Dufresne, what do you say? Do you remember? Hope. That's what I want to I wanna have some hope. And what did Red say? Red is like Job. Hope is a dangerous thing in here. It'll drive a man mad. Remember that? So that's what, what Job is getting at here. He says, I want, you to, I want you to experience that sense of hope so that you can understand what it's like to have a completely dashed. That's what his birthday is like. This is guy. If he, if you get a birthday invitation for Job, you're busy. That's all. All I'm saying is you're busy. You don't want to. He said, "Don't let my eyelids see the morning." No, no, that, and he's sort of comparing maybe the horizon as the as the sun comes up. If you watch the sunrise, kind of like how it would look if your eyelids are opening and all of a sudden the light is brightening. He's saying, "I hope your eyes stay closed." That's that's what he feels about the day of his birth. Verse 10, a little bit graphic because he is talking a little bit about 
anatomy related to birthing. Uh, and, and so we're not going to get, I'm not a doctor, so we won't get into that. But he says, he wishes the doors of the womb had been shut, that he wouldn't have been able to get out. That, the, that he would not have been able to get out of his womb to hide trouble from his eyes. It would have been better to be trapped in this barren stone womb and die in there than to come out and experience the heartache uh, he's feeling. So now this sounds really depressing. Uh, it, <laughs> it doesn't just sound depressing. It actually is depressing. Okay. <laughs> but what, is the, what I have to remind us of having worked through that Job is actually being uh, profoundly God-oriented because, remember, his understanding of life is God is the source of the human. God is the source of a person's life. So this complaint is aimed at God who allowed his birthing to happen. So it's not merely a complaint of, my life is terrible, I wish I wouldn't have been born. The complaint primarily is, God, why did you allow me to come out? That's the complaint. Primarily, it's God-oriented. All of his complaints are God-oriented. One writer said it this way, Job's friends are going to talk about God to Job. Job is going to talk to God. And, and we'll see that. Not 100% of the time, but most of the time, that's the main difference between Job and his friends. Job and his, Job's friends are going to come to him and try to explain God to him. And Job is going to usually talk to to God, because he's oriented towards trying to wrestle with how does this God, who I thought, I thought we were on good terms, and how did we end up here? And God, if we're going to end up here, if you and I were so close, why didn't you just kill me in the womb? That would that would have been that would seems like the reasonable uh, thing to do. Okay, just when we thought it couldn't get any worse, verse eleven through nineteen is where Job longs for death. Keep this oriented towards understanding God properly is we need to understand Job is not being suicidal. Okay, What Job is thinking about here is God-oriented, and he is not thinking, I want to end my life in despair. He's connecting this primarily to his relationship with God. God, why am I still alive? And we'll, and we'll show you in particular here in a, min in a minute uh, how he explains that. So verse 11 is kind of a transition. Look at verse 11. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not come for, out from the womb and expire? So that's what he would have hoped for. So now, stillbirth. Yeah, or come out and die very soon after. You know, that's what, which, remember, in, in ancient times, the, the rate of stillbirth was, was enormous. I mean, it was, what, 200 years ago, half, half the children didn't, it didn't make it. You know, it's very normal. Uh, why, why do you think people had 13 kids? Because you had to have that many kids to get one to adulthood. Because your kids are your retirement. They're the ones who are going to make sure there's food in front of you. And nobody breaks into your house when you're old. And so you've got to have a dozen kids if you're going to get one to live to adulthood. And, and that's, that was a, it's very practical. You know, and, and maybe that seems very utilitarian to us. But not if your world is survival. And that's. Here, so Job is wondering, of all the kids who were stillborn, why not make it? So we're going to work through, let me read verses 11 through 19. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb, and expire? Why did the knees receive me, or why the breasts that I should nurse? For then I would have lain down and been quiet. I would have slept. Then I would have been at rest. With kings and counselors of the earth who rebuilt ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not as hidden, stillborn child, as infants who never see the light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease together. They, they hear not the voice of the taskmaster. The small and the great are there, and the slave is free from his master. So he wonders, why am I not dead? Verse 12, he says, why was I given to a mom instead of a grave? Isn't that a strange question? But he said, looking at the condition of my life, why am I birth God? Remember, this is God-oriented. Why didn't you just take me? Instead of putting me at, on the knees of my father and at the breast of my mother, why didn't you just take me and have me in a grave? That, that, that would make more sense to my current life condition, keeping in mind 
that he knows God is in the charge of, of life and uh, death. So uh, verse 13, he's sort of going reminiscing about what could have been. Question? Okay. Ruth, you're dismissed. You are lucky because it's going to get depressing <laughs> up in here. Okay. So verse 13, he, he, he sort of is reminiscing about what could have been. Have you ever thought about that? Things in your life don't go the way you want. And you think about decisions you have made and circumstances in your life. And you, oh, what could have been. And so that's what Job is doing, thinking about his life. Oh, what could have been. Verse 13, I could have been laying down at rest as a baby. I could, this all could have been ended so easily way back then. It, I could have been laying down to rest and been quiet. I would have, been, I would have slept and, and been at rest. He thinks about all the people who have died before him. He goes, look, the kings and counselors of the earth, the, the powerful and the wise, they're all dead. And the better for it. You, know, you can be a powerful king who rebuilds cities even, or a wise counselor who always knows what the right thing to do is. What happens at the end? You die. I don't want to tell you how the end, how your life ends, but if God doesn't come back in time, we all have a funeral, right? That's the way it goes, right? And so he's saying, man, those guys are so lucky. Man, their life is over, and, and, and once you're dead, the kings and the wise and uh, the stillborn infant, we're all in the same place. It's, it makes no difference. What, why would I live this terrible life? Why would God give me this terrible life knowing that in the end, we all just end up in the same place, at rest. He doesn't go into a great description of heaven or glory or rewards or presence of God, but he does see death here as rest from the trials of life. It doesn't mean that Job doesn't have a view of heaven or glory or uh, experience a relationship with God. Job clearly, throughout the book, we're going to see, has an understanding that when you die, you don't end. Your life doesn't end when your life ends. You keep on. But he doesn't go into great detail other than to say, the end of life is a time of rest. And he's, what difference does it make if you're a great king or a great wise person? Because at the end, you just rest in your, your grave, so to speak. He keeps going in verse 15. Or well, what about the wealthy? Wealthy people who have houses filled with silver and gold. Where are they? At rest in their grave. So he's just simply saying, look, I don't understand why I'm here, God whether you're a powerful king or a wise counselor or a wealthy prince or a stillborn baby, at the end of the day, we're all just at rest in the same place. So, and his thinking is this, knowing what my life is going to be like, God, it would have made perfect sense to me to send me to rest when I was born. Why are we doing this? Because this doesn't make any sense to me. That, that It would have made more sense for you to end my life as a, as a stillborn as he says in verse 16, why was I not hidden like a stillborn who never sees the light? There's more people in the grave he talks about here. Look at, look at verse 17. There, that is on the other side of the grave, the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. That, that first sentence, uh, or that first line there, the wicked cease from troubling, it's really hard to know what he's saying. It could mean, because uh, again, he's not really getting into... Uh, Judgment or reward, hell or Sheol or the grave or heaven or glory. He's more just saying at the end, the wicked are no longer doing what they're doing. They're, they, they've stopped doing that because they're not here anymore. And also, the weary are at rest. And, and I think he would count himself among the weary. The, the other side is a place of rest, he would say. Also, verse 18, prisoners are at ease. Prisoners are no longer in prison. They, they no longer hear the voice of the taskmaster. A prisoner here is a description of uh, forced labor. A laborer who either because of indebtedness or war, if a country was con conquered, oftentimes their citizens would be put into forced labor. Israel did that routinely. And so he's saying now, finally, once they're in the tomb, the taskmaster can't do anything to them. You know, what's, our, what's the old phrase? You beat a dead horse. You know, we can't. Once the, once the forced laborer is down, they're, they're at rest. And, and Job's argument here in verse 19, the small and great are there. The slave is free from his master. And Lord, I could be free of all of this if you would end my life. And frankly, Lord, why didn't it end sooner? He's also saying all of the joy of his wealth and children was not worth it. 
is what he's also saying. Because he has had some joy and pleasure in his life. And what he is saying is, no thanks, I don't need all that. And we understand this. Many times if we've been hurt enough or experienced enough loss, we become a little bit hesitant to make relational connection because it's like it's better to be more to be alone than to make a relational connection and experience abandonment or betrayal or loss. That's kind of what he's saying here. I would have just soon not have all those kids than mourn their passing. And anybody who has lost someone close to them knows exactly what he's saying. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Lord, I... It would have been better back there, okay? And, and he's really struggling with God here. Well, what's the plan here, man? Really wrestling, kind of talking out loud uh, about it. Okay, any questions or comments on Job wishing he had died as a stillborn baby? That's, wow, Job, still wrestling. Okay, let's keep going. This is exciting. Verses 20 through 23 were almost... Uh, we're almost done with this section, and next week we'll get into Eliphaz. Verses 20 through 23, Job really talks about how much he disdains, dislikes, maybe even hates his life. Verses 20 through 23. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter soul, who long for death but it comes not? And dig for it more than for hidden treasures. Dig for it. The digging for death. He's like, I hunt for death more than hidden treasures. Who rejoice, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden? Whom God has hedged in. I remember talking to my grandfather. He died when he was 99 years old. My dad's uh, father died when he was 99 in the last 20 years of his life, you know, he'd come over for birthdays and Christmas and stuff. He'd sit in his wheelchair, you know, 75, 80 to, to 90. These are a lot of years, you know. You can do a lot in 20 years. And I say, well, how you doing, Grandpa? He goes, I want to die. Goes, Why do you want to die? Can't see, can't eat, can't hear. What am I supposed to do? You know, and he was just being practical, and he was... Born in 1903, you know, lived through the Depression, World War I, World War II. And, and so that generation had a way of sort of just telling you what they thought, whether you liked it or not. <laughs> and, uh, and his point was, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I can't see. I can't hear. You know, he's sitting in a room full of people. He doesn't know anything that's going on. And, um, and he can't taste anything. He can't eat anything. He, he just has no idea. What am I doing here? And this is what, what Job is sort of describing. What am I doing here? I don't understand. I, I, I look for death. Uh, there was a gentleman in our church, and he passed away. I won't say who it is. And, uh, but uh, his family told me this story. He was, he was napping in the, in, in the corner of his room, and this is just a few weeks before uh, he went home to be with the Lord, and he was napping in the room, and they were all sitting there chatting, and he was sleeping in his, uh, his recliner. And he sat up, and he goes, Jesus? And he said, no, it's just us, Grandpa. Dang it. He laid back down and went back to sleep. He was so disappointed. He woke up. He thought it was over. He thought he had died in his sleep. And it's still his family who said, well, wouldn't it be funny to have it? Oh, Jesus, no, it's just me, Grandpa. And dang it. And he laid back down and went back to sleep. Try another nap, see if that does the trick. It wasn't too long after that. But that's exactly what, yeah, this was a positive. He knew he was old. He knew he was sick. And he knew he was going. And he just wanted to be home. So he was getting up from the positive side. Job is sort of the other side of that. He's sort of saying, I don't understand, given the circumstances of my life, what it is that has me still here. And, and what we want to argue here is, is Job is understanding his still being alive is spiteful action from God himself. And that's what is really challenging him. Let me show you how we can see that. Look in verse 23. Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? Where have we seen that phrase, hedged in, before? This is Bible trivia time. Okay, look at Job 1.10. Job 1.10. Now, he wasn't there, but it's interesting he uses these words. God said to Satan, hey, uh, notice Job, he's doing pretty good. And Satan says this, well, haven't you put a hedge around him and his house? So why did Job have wealth? Why did Job have kids? Why did Job have 
all of his stuff. Why? God only. So, and, Job, and Job knows this, even though he wasn't there for this conversation. He knows. What I have is only because God has seen fit to hedge it in and protect it. So what does Job still have? He still has faith, but what, what, he still has breath. He's still alive. So why is he still alive? Because God kept him alive. So what does he know? He knows life sucks and God is keeping me alive on purpose. That's what he's saying. The only reason I'm not dead. I mean, look at what has happened in just this short period of time. I should be dead. Tornadoes, fire from heaven, invaders, you know, infections, sores. And you get, there's only reason, there's only one reason uh, to say I'm still alive. God has had me in and kept me alive. Who? would keep a guy alive in this condition. It's, I can't remember what movie it is, but I remember a line from it. It probably is inappropriate. So if you don't judge me for Shawshank, judge me for this one. And uh, like, I'll still say it. There's worse. Um, but he was threatening a person and said, you know, I will, I will kill you, and then I will give you blood transfusions, keep you alive, and kill you again. So he's really trying to threaten the guy. Like, I will, I will kill you, and I'm, I'm going to keep you alive so I can keep making your life really painful. And it's terrible and Of here, in, w- w- no. Uh, so do we? Do we know the time frames of anything? The only thing we do know in terms of time frame is there were seven days from when, from when the friend showed up to when he started talking. How much time passed between when the events happened to when his friend showed up is hard to say, but it wouldn't have been very long. Um, my guess would be maybe a month or two. You know that he lost everything and is now out in his ash heap. Yeah, so, so what Job is saying about God is he's like that, that villain I described in that movie, that God is giving him all this awful stuff, and he's just keeping him alive to enjoy it. I mean, isn't that, this is where he's really struggling. He's like, my life is really, really hard. If God was truly a God of mercy and grace and kindness, he would end it. He would end this. That's how he's wrestling with the realities of what God is life. That's why he, he says there in, uh, in verse 23, Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? God is keeping me alive. There's a number of places in this section where Job says, uh, why? And we have to understand his why there is not trying to understand something about his condition that has led to an event. So a lot of times when we ask why, uh, you know, when we shout, why to the heavens? And that's a fair question. The psalmist does it a number of times. So if you have prayed or are praying, why God? I'm not telling you to stop doing that. But I want you to know something about Job's perspective might be different than the way we pray that. We're praying, why God? Because we want to try and fit. How is the narrative of my life fit what you're... What, basically, we're saying, what have I done? What have, what, what have I done here that... Job is not, we're going to see throughout the book of Job, he is not arguing that. His friends are going to argue that. Job is saying to God, what's your problem? Why are you doing this to me? There's no good reason. And we're going to see that through the book of Job. When Job is saying why, and he's not being disrespectful, he is a little bit later, but he is not questioning the realities of his existence based on what is happening in his life, he wants to, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? This makes no sense. Are you raising your hand? Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, the question is, is he thinking God is being uh, cruel? You know, I don't get the sense that, and that's how I'll say it. Um, I think the better way of saying it to fit Job as a whole is he doesn't think he's being fair. So he doesn't see him as a, a, a sadist that enjoys people's pain, that God is taking delight in, in Job's suffering, that somehow he gets his kicks. So I don't think he's approaching it that way, which maybe is what I'm deriving from the word cruel. Job is going to make the clear argument he thinks he's not being just. He's going to say that pretty much outright. And so the why is he wants God to substantiate 
the realities of his existence from God's perspective. Because Job is, he's going to pretty boldly say, I don't deserve this. I, he's not really going to hedge on, on that at all. So I think he's really trying to get at God's motive. I don't know if it would be cruel uh, if that helps. Okay, good, great question, great comment. Um, okay, let's look at verses 24 through 26, and we're going to end here. Finally, we've got, uh, let me just recap uh, the sections if I can. We had, and, and there's a lot of them, so the first one was Job curses his birth. You remember that? We don't need to review it. That's depressing. Secondly, Job longs for death. Then we just finished, Job despises his own life and then wonders why God would keep him alive on purpose. Why would God would sort of intentionally uh, keep him uh, alive. And then finally, in verses 24 through 20, 26, Job groans. It's just Job finally in an exasperated groaning. Verses, let me read it, 24, 25, and 6. For my sighing comes instead of my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. For the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest. Trouble comes. Okay. So verse, let's look at 24. 24. 24 is almost unintelligible to translate. What is clear is he is describing deep, loud, repeated groanings from every cell of his body. That's, that's what he's describing here. Uh, I don't know if you, one, uh, one writer said this, any good parent knows what their carpet smells like because they've been on their face praying for their kids so many times. And, uh, and sometimes things happen, and your prayer sounds like a sick dog. Have you ever, have you ever prayed that way? And it's, you don't have to say it out loud, but it's, you don't got nothing to say. You just, uh, you know. That's actually a fantastic way. You say, well, that's praying in tongues, right? The Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings that cannot be uttered. And what that, when in that verse, what it's saying is, however much you're feeling about something you're praying for, whether it be joy or anguish, the Holy Spirit is communicating and experiencing that more. It's really important in that verse. It's not merely saying he has better access to God, because that actually wouldn't be theologically accurate. Nobody has more access to God than a believer. What it is saying is the Holy Spirit is actually able to communicate. Say, listen, he's in a lot of pain. But you know what, honestly, God, he has no idea how much pain he is. Why do we not know how much pain we are? Because we medicate. We're in a lot of pain, so we watch 10 hours of Netflix and drink two bottles of wine. Yeah, but we're not supposed to laugh at that one, so. Coors Light? I don't, I don't know. What's your med? Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what to tell you. Or, or, you or, we, or we fill our life with recreation. So we go out, and we're doing all kinds of stuff. We're staying busy because we're trying to make sure we don't stop and actually think about the cruddy stuff. And so we don't even know how much pain we're actually in because we're trying to mask it so much. And the Holy Spirit goes before the Lord and says, hey, they don't even know how much pain they're in. And here it is. And the Holy Spirit communicates that. And what Job is doing here is he's saying, I'm doing that from every square inch of my being. This deep, guttural, unintelligible, oh, my Lord, have mercy. And that's what he's uh, saying here. Verse 25, the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. So now he's saying, the thing that I was so worried about has happened. And what is he worried about is go back to chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. His sons and his, his daughters would sometimes hold feasts, interestingly, on what was likely their birthdays. That's kind of interesting. When the days of the feast had run their course, Job would send and consecrate them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. So Job feared two things. Number one, the judgment of God for sin. And so he pursued right relationship with God through sacrifice. And that was appropriate. We talked at length about that last week. So if you want to hear more about that, there's a video online. You can go check it out, right? The other thing he dreaded 
was that his relationship with God would be rended, separated. That suddenly his closeness with God would not be as close as he thought. So he had all these things built into his life, these priestly functions to enable him to experience close relationship with God. And the thing he dreaded most has happened. He feels like God is distant, not listening, and has hedged him in to keep him alive in the most suffer, biggest suffering. So what, what we might say, one writer has summarized it this way. Job is saying, my suffering is not the problem. The problem is God is absent. Uh, I'm going to go back to, uh, I, sh- I have to repeat. I'm trying, Pam. Pam reminded me, repeat the questions. We can, Pat, last week, Pam was in the new mom's room, and she's like, I have no idea what was asked. And she cursed the day of that study. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the question was, uh, did he feel abandoned? Is that what you asked, Diana? Do you think God had abandoned him? He, you know, again, back to what we said before, he felt God was being unfair unjust and no longer was accessible for dialogue so if there was sin in job's life he knew the routine offer a sacrifice pray confess repent feast give be generous all of these things he knew the relational terms of his uh, the terms of the relationship with god made sense and now he's asking god to give an answer for what's going on god give me your reasoning and it's nothing it's, it's nothing. We know exactly what that's like. I mean, everybody, I, I think anybody who's prayed about anything for any significant period of time, like a day, we know what it's like to, to pray. You've done this. We, maybe you're like me. A lot of these kind of prayers are at night when you can't sleep. And uh, what I say is kind of echoing one of the Psalms is you pray and it hits the ceiling and bounces down and hits you in the face. Yeah, you ever felt like that sometimes? Of course we have. It's called being human. And, and having this relationship with God that feels weird sometimes. And Job's suffering is where, are you paying attention, God? Can you hear what's going on? Is, is there anything? Are you making any connection here? So I don't know if it's so much abandonment. Boy, you know, Diana, now that I think about it, it might be worse. He's here and he's not doing anything. He's not paying attention. So it's almost like if you're, he's saying, I'm hedged in. God has purposefully kept me alive, which means God in some ways is near. And he's just standing there. So God, what's going on? Hello? Anything? I mean, wouldn't that be frustrating? But let me rephrase. Isn't that frustrating? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, that Job's right there with us. He's right. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, so Kevin's comment, if you, if you, if you guys didn't hear it, you can feel abandoned and still have confidence he's there. And that's really, really important because we're going to see that in Job. He's able to help us see that the emotions of the moment don't define reality. They are what we're experiencing within that reality, and they shouldn't be, we shouldn't cast them off like they're nothing. Of course, they're, they're in many ways everything, but our feelings don't define the reality. The reality is defined about what we know about God. And Kevin, you're right on because this is Job's struggle. Here's what I know about God. He, this doesn't fit. But this is how I'm feeling, and now he's really wrestling with God. And God is going to eventually answer him. His answer won't be terribly satisfying to Job or us, but he brings him to the right place. So that's a really, really good uh, comment uh, here. Okay, um, verse 26 is probably, we probably could have just said verse 26 and understood it. The way this is phrased is the way I read it, very short, staccato, Boom, boom, boom. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest. Trouble comes. That, that's the description of his life in this moment. And, and this is the opposite of his life before the trouble, his life in relationship with God, and it's also, in context of this passage, that's the opposite of the grave. Notice he described the grave in the opposite of those terms. The grave is the place of ease. The grave is the place of quietness and rest. The grave is the place where trouble is ended. And his, he's going, I don't understand why I'm still, still here. So this is Job's moan, his, his groan. Uh, is God offended by Job's groaning? Okay, keep in mind when we get to the end of Job, and I'm going to remind us of this throughout. At the end of Job, 
uh, God says to Job's friends, you did not speak rightly of me as Job has. So Job here, as you're reading through this, you might feel like this is an inappropriate way to address the reality of God and in, in circumstance. There is nothing inappropriate whatsoever in this passage. This is a guy talking to God, and I would suggest, I would hope we're not always praying in this level of despair. I would hope. But I would also suggest if you've lived longer than 20 minutes, that you're going to have prayers like this. And it, can God handle it? Guess what? He already knows what you're thinking anyway. May as well just tell him. That's all. That's what I would say, you know. And that's what that's what Job is doing here. Okay, I've got three applications. I reduced it to the normal three last week. It was totally out of line. I had four. Any questions or comments before we jump into those? Yeah, Gene. Uh, the. Uh, let's see, the time frame between here and chapter 42 is probably not terribly long. You know, it, I would say maybe weeks yeah, or months. or Yeah, it's not, he has had enough time for his disease to develop. Um, uh, but we don't have any sense that this is years and years and years. Yeah, but, uh, but, uh, but, but yeah, it, it has enough time that at some point his, his skin disease goes from merely itching to scratching to oozing, to becoming clearly infected to some degree. Yeah, so that would require uh, a little bit of time. Um, yeah, because really the time is not, the, how long he suffers isn't the point. I mean, the kids who died stay dead. Because later on, yeah, I don't, again, I don't want to give away the ending, but he has more kids, Right? Does that make the fact that he lost children go away? No, of course not. I mean, so that reality of loss is same wife. We don't have any reason to think he got a new wife. Yeah, let's go easy on her. She sticks with him while he's oozing, you know. Okay, I'm going to read this because I can, because I wrote it a lot here, so hopefully it makes sense. One thing there's an application. One thing sufferers can do, and and who are sufferers? people who are alive. If you're not suffering, you know somebody who is. One of the things sufferers can do is verbally processing like Job does. So while Job's thoughts about his, uh, about God and God's actions are provocative, um, controversial, very confrontational, throughout all of his conversation, Job maintains this very clear, steadfast reality that he understands. God is in total control. So while his statements are provocative and controversial, and maybe if somebody said some of the things Job says, we might go, oh, gee, wow, you're really, you're really upset. Job, all the way throughout, he understands God is in total and complete control and actively involved in every uh, moment. So here's what Job isn't wrestling with, and I need to, we need to think about it because this is a very Western, secular way of thinking. Job isn't wondering, is there God? He's not, this, that's not what he's wrestling with. We might, maybe sometimes, is there God? Job isn't wrestling with, I can't believe in a God who. Yeah, I, I can't believe in a God who. Uh, that Logically, that doesn't make any sense. I understand why we would say it, but we should say it a better way. He said, I don't like a God who. That's what we ought to, because we, remember, God doesn't exist because we believe. His existence has nothing to do with our belief. His existence has everything to do with him being God. You know, so Job isn't wrestling with sort of these very Western modern notions. Well, I don't know if I could believe God who would allow X to happen. And because Job knows there, the question isn't whether or not God is, it's whether or not I can get along with him. And that's what he's struggling with. And so he's not wrestling with whether or not there is God or can I believe in this kind of God. He's not struggling with whether or not God is powerful. He, his, he's completely convinced God is totally in control. And then totally powerful. What Job is struggling with is there is God who is totally in control and totally powerful, which means he did this. That's what he's struggling with. God did this. Now, a part of us uh, might think that it is disturbing to think of the harsh realities of our life and imagine that God did it. We, we might think that's 
doesn't provide comfort. And I, I don't know if that does provide comfort. I don't know if it's intended to provide uh, comfort. But I might say this. There is less comfort in imagining there is no God who is. So what Job is, is clear on, it is, it's much more reasonable and, in fact, provides a much clearer path to life to just understand the reality. This is what life is, and God is totally in charge of it. And we might imagine there would be some sort of peace that would come from pretending God isn't. But I, I guarantee you, if you've done that for very long, it does not provide the peace you might imagine. Now it's just random, and, and there's no meaning. Is there a difference between holding God accountable and, and blaming God? Right. Job does not ever accuse God of doing evil, which I might connect that with the word blame, is you've done something evil towards me. Job clearly makes it his opinion that God is not being fair. Or at minimum, he wants God to explain to him how this is fair. I, maybe we would say it better that way. It's not necessarily he's accusing God of being unjust, he wants God, and later on he's going to say, I want to have a hearing. I want to stand before this guy. Hey, God, come on, explain this to me. What's up with this business? And so that's different than blaming. He's not saying God has done something evil. He's done something. He's powerful. He's God. He's in charge. He can do whatever he wants. I would like an ex explanation, though. And um, God's going to make that clear. He, he doesn't owe an explanation. Yeah. Don't, but you, now we're getting into Job 40 and 41. Yeah, so... Um, Go ahead, Pam. Right. And why did it change? And he feels like, and he feels like the one who did something different is God. It, like God did something different. And it doesn't make sense. Yeah, good. All right. Uh, coming attractions, and we're talking about the end of the book. Job is going to learn over the course of the time that many of his why questions are not going to be satisfactorily answered. But what we see in this passage is there's a whole lot going on that Job doesn't see. His reference to, I'm alive because I've been hedged in by God. And, and seeing that that was actually something referenced in the spiritual realm when God and the accuser were having a conversation. So what we know when it comes to the spiritual realm, when it comes to the overall plan of God to redeem humankind, when we understand and think about the overall plan of God throughout the universe to bring glory to himself, there is more Job doesn't know than what Job does know. And so Job is not going to get a lot of satisfactory answers um, because there's, there's too much that Job isn't aware of. So what we should think about Job's life is Job's life is a complete tragedy unless his life is a part of something that's bigger than Job's life. And that's where ultimately we're going to find the, the ray of hope in Job's life. His suffering isn't meaningless because what he is going through is fundamentally a part of what God is doing to bring himself glory. In his plan to redeem humankind, to conquer the enemy of the devil, to conquer the enemy of, of death, and, and sin. So if Job's experience of life is just merely random acts of carbon-based life forms, it's a terrible tragedy. However, if Job's life fits into something bigger, which is the plan of God, his life isn't a tragedy, his life is a victory. And that's one of the ways things that Job is going to have to wrestle with. And honestly, that's one of the things we need to wrestle with because God doesn't ever really completely reveal everything he's up to in our life and how it fits into what he's doing. And so that requires an element of, okay, God, I know you're doing something really good and really great and it's bigger than me and I know my part of it is to experience some grief in the short term. Really hard, but that's where hope is found. Something is going on in my life that's bigger than me and it fits into what God is doing to bring himself glory. One day we're going to know. When we cross over into the, into the grave where Job is now, 
we're going to go, this, I think we're going to do two things in heaven when we first get there. We're going to see it and go, whoa, God, this is way over the top. Seriously, it's embarrassing what you've done here. This is fantastic. And then secondly, we're going to go, oh, I get it. Okay. Why didn't you tell me? And here's why he doesn't tell us now. Because if he told us now why, we'd say that's not a good enough reason. So if, if you went up to God and said, why is this crummy thing happening? And he said, oh, it's because of this. We'd say, are you ser- that's the dumbest reason I've ever heard. That's what we would say because we're, 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 you know, we're just, yeah, we're sinful. But when we get to that side, we're going to go, oh, oh, yeah, no, you got it. You're good. We're good, God. Where's my house? Okay, are we on to number three yet? Okay, there's a big difference between despair and sadness with God. Okay, so in Thessalonians, Paul talks about we don't despair like those who have no hope. We grieve as those who have hope. So there's a big difference between despair and being sad with God. Job is not despairing because he's still engaging with God. He is saying, I'm sad and life sucks, but I'm with God uh, in it. I'm, am I echoing? No, Jerry's figuring it out. You'll get it turned off, Jerry. Sorry, I don't mean to embarrass you. So Job here is just being real. People who are very old, like I talked about my grandpa, uh, people whose life is at an end will have these same kind of questions. I don't understand what's going on. I would prefer to no longer be here. And that's not despair. It's just merely wanting uh, what's next. I would actually say this about Job. He's just being rational. He's just being reasonable with God. In in fact, those who are in despair, we tend to put too much emphasis on the suffering of of itself. I can't hear. Am I speaking in tongues? I'm not even saying anything. I'm speaking. Yeah. There's a difference between despair and sadness with God. So just because I'm sad and I'm with God doesn't mean I'm despairing. Despairing says there's no hope anymore in God. So I, there's a really important distinction because this is, how are we doing? Oh, my lands. Are you serious? Yeah. Um, many Christians think it's not okay to be sad. It's ridiculous. Jesus wept at a funeral where he knew the guy was coming back to life. So um, so I think we, when we look at Job, he's just being rational. He looks at suffering his life and what God is like, and he's, he's really sad and, and frustrated. Um, in any area of suffering, we, in fact, do well to have our sadness occur in relationship and in light of who God is. doesn't mean we suddenly get happy, it, but uh, we, can re- we can be sad with God and say, God, I understand what you're doing. I understand what, what's up. I understand what this is about. That's not despair. That's just being reasonable. Um, okay, let me close in prayer. Sorry, I didn't realize it was, why didn't somebody signal? That's what Jerry was doing. He's trying, we're done, we're done. God, we thank you for your joy. And God, I would just pray even in this moment as we've plumbed the depths of some heartache, we've thought about things that are sad, things in our own past that we had tried to put away for a little bit and they've come to light. I pray in this moment you would give us the peace of knowing we're not alone because we're with you and we're not alone because we're with others who are going through similar stuff. So, God, uh, I pray that you would show us the light of hope we have in Jesus, that all of the difficulties we face are found uh, and will be made whole in Christ one day. But till that day, Lord, give us strength to rest in you and to remember how close you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless. Sorry we went a little bit long, and uh, have a good evening.